In a sunny afternoon on April 19, 1995, a five foot six inches tall man walked into two Pittsburgh banks and robbed the bank in broad daylight by holding a gun to the teller. He wore no masks or made no attempts to hide his face, just simply walked in and executed his crime and left. As you might expect, this incident was captured in the security cameras and then later reported to the local authorities that day. The police traced his residence and, by midnight, reached there to arrest him. When they proceeded to arrest him, he promptly responded, But I wore the juice. What he was trying to say was that he had rubbed lemon juice all over his face, So it was impossible for the police to have seen him rob the bank in the security footage because robbing the lemon juice must have made his face invisible to the security cameras. You see, he knew that the lemon juice is used as an invisible link, which is true scientifically. So he reasoned that logically rubbing it on his face would have rendered his face invisible to the security cameras which, of course, was not the case. The detectives and other officials in the case confirmed that he was not delusional or on drugs, but he was just incredibly convinced of a mistaken belief coupled with a lack of acknowledgement of the flaws in his reasoning. That night, he got arrested and gained the status of a perplexing figure in criminal history. If the explanation that he gave the police is not making sense yet, that's because it has no logic per se. You might think this is a fictional story, but the truth is, it's not. To verify my claim, search for the case of MacArthur Vila, the man who rubbed lemon juice and executed a bank robbery. The year after, in 1996, This incident got the attention of a Cornell psychology professor, David Dunning, who, along with his then-graduate student, Justin Kruger, embarked on assessing why this behaviour had occurred. In a series of experiments, Dunning and Kruger went on to assess undergraduate psychology students while asking them to respond to quizzes on a number of domains like logic, grammar, etc., Following this, the students were asked to rate their own performance in those quizzes. Now, you see, the performance in the quiz can be considered as an objective measure of the student's performance, while self-reporting their perceptions of their performance can be counted as a more subjective measure of their competency. So the results of the studies indicated that the students who had the lowest scores on the quiz erroneously reported as having received very high scores. More specifically, the students who scored near the bottom percentile estimated their skills in the tested domains to be far more superior than the two-thirds of the other students tested. While those who had scored high had a much more accurate perception of their abilities. These findings led the researchers to deduce that people with limited competence tend to display a certain type of a cognitive bias, wherein their limited competency leads them to overestimate their abilities. This came to be called as the Dunning and Kruger effect, and it was published in their seminal work in 1999. Since then, over two decades of psychology research and numerous studies from these researchers have found evidence in support of this phenomenon. Now, it's important to note that the Dunning-Kruger effect does not make any statement about the level of intelligence of people. So, the Dunning-Kruger effect is not a judgment on someone's overall intelligence but it rather focuses on the discrepancy between the perceived and the actual competence in specific tasks or domains. Explaining the essence of this phenomena, David Dunning once stated, quote, 
Not knowing the scope of your own ignorance is a part of the human condition. The problem with it is we see it in other people and we don't see it in ourselves. The first rule of thumb of the Dunning-Kruger Club is you don't know you're a member of the Dunning-Kruger Club. In fact, you might have heard Elon Musk also state something similar in certain interviews. Quote, you don't know what you don't know. Which, other than its tautological ring, essentially captures the essence of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Now, while the findings from these lab studies might seem like a rather low-impact manifestation of the Dunning-Kruger effect and thus seem rather harmless, in real world, we have witnessed some serious manifestations of the Dunning-Kruger effect with severe negative consequences, such as the Wheeler robbery incident. But unfortunately, that's not it. Another rather catastrophic exemplar of the Dunning-Kruger effect is the downfall of a one Silicon Valley's uprising medical tech company called Theranos. Theranos was founded by Elizabeth Holmes at the ripe age of 19. Elizabeth, who was described as a driven and ambitious woman, was determined to create a company that envisioned to revolutionize the traditional medical testing industry. She claimed to have developed a device called Edison that could perform an extensive range of medical tests using only a few drops of blood from a finger prick, with a goal to make blood tests more accessible, affordable, and less invasive for patients. What worked for Elizabeth was that her idea garnered a lot of interest from some of the biggest investors in America, leading to a blockbuster start of Theranos. The company's blood and medical test kit was soon made available to all the major retail outlets all over America, with many people using the services only to be misdiagnosed. You see, despite the lack of experience and expertise in the medical testing industry, Elizabeth believed she could disrupt and revolutionize it. This overconfidence, or rather the self-perception, or of overestimating her abilities, resulted her to make poor decisions and choices over time not enabling her to recognize her own limitations and ultimately led to the catastrophic collapse of a company with severe legal implications. Now, a valid question that arises at this stage is what causes this biased state of cognition? So, the larger research landscape indicates that investigations on the exact causes of the Dunning-Kruger effect is an active area of research, with psychologists still trying to understand the specific mechanisms via which this particular effect is observed or given rise to. However, a key causal explanation that has been widely cited is the lack of metacognitive abilities giving rise to the Dunning-Kruger effect. Now, the concept of metacognition is a really interesting one and it's it's a part of research area that people study in itself. So, What metacognition actually refers to is the ability to think about one's thinking. It allows us to actively assess both our knowledge bases and our knowledge about those knowledge bases. So how well do you know something and how well do you think you know something about that something? Now, because of this evaluative nature of metacognition, it allows us to assess or evaluate both the quality of our understanding about the world and the accuracy of that understanding as well. So when one has weak metacognitive abilities, it tends to impair their ability to discriminate between their objective skill levels and their subjective perceptions of how well they did or how well they can do in that specific field, making it increasingly difficult to identify their incompetencies. The metacognitive account is one of the most commonly cited accounts explaining why we see the biases like the Dunning-Kruger effect that we do.
However, like I mentioned, this is still an active area of research and we still need more investigations to understand the more nuanced layers that give rise to such biased perceptions. And this research is extremely important considering the implications it can have, as we saw in the case of Vela or Elizabeth Holmes. Now, in addition to understanding the causes that give rise to the Dunning-Kruger effect, recognizing the Dunning-Kruger effect behavior and guarding against its pitfalls is crucial in navigating the complexities of human cognition and more generally everyday life. So how can we spot this bias in ourselves and others? And more importantly, how can we mitigate its influences? Let's delve into some practical strategies for identifying and addressing this behavior. Now, the Dunning-Kruger effect can manifest in the form of overconfidence and inflated self-assessment. Being vocal about someone's views on a particular topic, even in the presence of contrary evidence, or being unwilling to consider alternative perspectives can occur due to the Dunning-Kruger effect. It can also manifest as the inability to recognize and acknowledge one's own limitations and being resistant to some form of feedback or constructive criticism from others that challenges the discrepancy between their objective and their subjective performances or competencies more generally. There are definitely some simple behavioral approaches we can take to reduce or completely avoid the Dunning-Kruger effect. Firstly, the acknowledgement that we have limited cognitive abilities as an aspect, which we will discuss in an upcoming episode, is a good place to start. We are indeed limited in our abilities, and that's true for most humans. So lacking knowledge about something is fine, as long as we are aware of it. Other than this, fostering a growth mindset, which allows us to remain open to the idea that our abilities can always be improved with practice and effort, critical thinking, as well as feedback, alternative perspectives, and identifying one's personal mistakes can help us reduce the impact of negative cognitive biases like the Dunning-Kruger effect by helping us to strengthen and develop our metacognitive abilities and overall awareness So while knowing everything about everything is not possible, but knowing just that could be all that you might ever need to know to avoid the trap of the Dunning-Kruger Club. 